All right, um, welcome to another exciting class. Uh, in the last class, we went through the details on the introduction to literature, and I told you there's a difference between literature in English and English literature. I also went ahead in that class to touch, you know, the importance of literary devices and literary terms. I told you the difference between the two, of course. I introduced you to defining literature. I stated clearly in that class that you, you can define literature the way you choose, as long as you can explain it in a logical way. Okay? Um, today, we'll talk about uh, what you need to scale through in literature in English. Okay, so when you get to the example, when you look back to how far you have prepared, what are the essential things you need that will help you as a YF student or as a GC student, as long as you're going to write both objective and theory, what do you need? Because I hear this question, I get this question all the time. Mr. Femi, what should I read? What aspect should I read in literature? What exactly is needed? You need to read things that touch both your test of objectives and of course the theory aspect. Now, so the first thing is first. You need a very rich knowledge of literary terms and devices. In the previous class, I just touched them on the surface. And I remember that I told, told you that literary terms what we have under drama, the literary terms under drama are different from those in poetry and in prose. So you have to treat them differently, like independently. Know all the literary terms under drama. Know all the literary terms under poetry. Know all the literary terms under what? Prose. And then, literary devices. The literary devices are the ones that when you look at drama, you look at prose, you look at poetry, they are common to the three. So you need to know all of them. Once you know them, then we can, we can begin, okay? Now, the next thing is that you need to understand that many students fail literature. You even see some students who will pass use of English and fail literature and they are in the art class. So what is the reason for this, okay? Many students fail literature because they write answers in past tense. It, it is a crime in literature for you to write your answer in past tense. And why is it so? This is so because in literature, we believe that every work of art is a living work. Why is this so? We believe that when someone writes, when you have a writer in literature and the person dies, that the person is not dead, that the person still continues to live in his work. So, you write your answer as though you can see it, it's happening directly in the present. As though the person is still what? Alive, telling you the story. So it's like killing the person again when you write your answer in past tense. You are saying the person is dead, dead. It's a crime in literature, it is not tolerated. Okay? Now, the purpose of literature is to make personal comments in your examination. Let me share a personal experience on this. Okay? There are some of you I know right now, you have read almost all the textbooks that you have, that you've laid your hands on, you've read them from cover to cover. To be sincere with you, you are reading another man's opinion. That man is making a commentary, a literary commentary, and he has written his own into a textbook. Or she has written her own into a textbook. You pick up that person's understanding and you you know, consume it voraciously without knowing that you are actually reducing yourself to a second class commentator. So, what is the purpose of literature? Most teachers in schools are supposed to pass across to the students the ability to be self confident. When you read up a book, pick up that book, read it, whatever you understand from it, go to your literary terms and devices, use it to analyze, make commentaries. This is what stands your results out compared to the, that of others. Some other persons will pick up a textbook, different text, in fact, to the point that it has become a norm. Once you use a particular textbook, there is a particular mark for it. Because with the moment you start, these guys have been marking for years. So once you start making a point, they know that ah, I've seen this before. It looks, it looks, it doesn't look novel, it doesn't look new. So what will make you an A student in literature is to be able to make personal commentaries. And you, I can bet it with you that you will never make commentaries until you have deep knowledge of literary terms and devices. 
which will enable you to flow. Okay? I remember while I was sitting my exam, that's the Wyatt exam. Um, then we read one book, um, uh, what's the title of this book again? Uh, Joyce of Motherhood. Yes, Joyce of Motherhood as a book. And I, did, I discovered that the teacher who taught me back then said to me that whatever I disagreed, whatever I disagreed with after reading the story, even if everybody is carrying around a particular opinion, whatever my own opinion is, I should go ahead and write. Which I did. Okay? Everyone is saying the title of the story should be Sorrows of Motherhood and not Joys of Motherhood. And when I got to the exam, I discovered that when I read the book, from the angle of a mother, I saw that the woman was not a sorrowful woman in the end. Though she died on a lonely street, abandoned by her children, under the rain. Okay? But in the end, the children are successful people. Bankers, lawyers, doctors, engineers who are living outside the country. Okay? So it is the joy of that woman, even in her dying, that she bore those children who are global icons. Okay? And that was the way I wrote my answer. I had an A1 in literature. So if I'm coming out to teach you something, I'm teaching you how to have that same A1. So I'm teaching you the nitty gritty. You need to be able to have personal commentaries in your examination. Do you get what I'm driving at? Okay, so don't be scared. If you read anything and you feel that this is what I understand from this story, as far as you can explain it, you get your marks. Okay, so um, let's proceed now to touching some of the literary devices and I'll show you how to use them to make commentaries. Okay, so please permit me. Yes. Literary devices. Okay, I hope you can see what I'm writing. Now, these are literary elements. Okay? them one after the other, pick them one after the other. The vices, I already explained that devices 
and literary elements. When we say something is literary element, element of literature. When we say something is an element of literature, they are those words, okay, that we use to drive the message hmm, to the reader or the audience. Now, literary terms, on the other hand, they are those words that describe what a thing or concept is called in a particular genre of literature. Maybe drama, prose, or poetry. Alright, so for the devices example into details, okay? Some of you are quite familiar with them, so I'll just brush through these devices. Team. Talking about the team. The team is the central message. The central message that the writer is trying to pass across to the audience. Okay? I love to make use of uh, Faceless by Amadaku as a very, very good way of explaining the theme. Okay? I, I kind of explained in the previous class that a thing is that thing that touches your mind to write. It is that thing you are trying to correct with your writing. Do you get that? That is what you are trying to correct with your writing or to address with your writing. Now, we have some things, okay? Those sub things are those other essential things that are important, you know, that we just touch in passing. As maybe as a result of this major problem, there are some other smaller problems that also need to be touched because it's the combination of those small problems that makes the bigger one. So the major thing is that major thing that the person is driving at. Why the sub things are those smaller points that are related to the major thing? Okay, so like in Faceless by Madapo, the major thing. Okay, is the theme of what? Street children. Children and absentee parents. That's all. That's like the major theme. Okay? But of course, we have sub teams. We have some other teams, you know, that create a lot of hazard in the community. Okay? Like when you have corruption. Okay, when we have negligence. Okay, when we have child abuse. Importance of education. Okay, superstition. It is. These other things you will see them in the story, but the major thing the woman Amada pushed, my very good friend, actually the last time we saw, it's been a long time. Um, if you go on Google and you type the name Ama, Ama Gato, you will see that she is a, a dark lady, dark complexion lady. Uh, she used to be light complexion. Um, I remember while we were seated in Kwame uh, Nkrumah University, we were gisting. And it was a very hot afternoon, so I said to her, um, sorry, we need to move inside now because the sun is shining. And then she was like, really? I said, yeah. I was like, if you don't get what I'm saying in my native tongue, if you don't go inside, I'm a dark hole. Meaning in Yoruba, we get dark. You understand? She said, I'm a dark hole. What's, what's that? I said, well, that's the way we say it in Yoruba, that we get dark. She said, wow, I'm a dark hole. Dark is strong. Dark is black. Dark is Africa. I like that name. What did you call it again? I said, I'm a Daku. She said, I'm a Daku. I like it. Some of you are doing like this in your room and where you are. Look to the board. Look at it. This is Ama. Remove the O. Eh? This is O. What do you have here? Dark then O. So packaged it. Okay? And that's how we have uh, Ama Daku writing. I'm also, I just don't want to, I'm not proud. I've written books too. Okay? But well, you're here to see them. Alright, so back to the class. Ama Daku decided to write and in her writing she's, she's pained because she cannot imagine that children are on the streets these children did not grow up like plants they came out from parents okay from the meeting of a man and a woman therefore where are these parents how can these children be on the streets surviving on their own very vulnerable especially the female children and you see her writing a very touching story Writing a very motivating story so that people can take up the course and remove children from the street, empower them, and remove them from the hands of their abusers. If you ask anybody, that is the team. 
the major thing that Amadako is trying to address. But we have some things. Okay? We're not going to that today. When we touch the stone itself, I'll deal with this one. Alright, so we leave thing, we come to plot. It's not plot of land. Here we're not giving any land. We're just talking about the foundation according to how the storyline of a writing is actually organized. Let me put it in another word. When we say plot, we are talking about the storyline, the organized arrangement of the storyline of a particular writing or anything you have read, the way the story is arranged from beginning to the end. Any story, have you watched any movie that does not have an end? <laughs> you've seen one. I know you will say you've seen one. <laughs> There's no story that has a beginning that does not have an end. Except probably the, the writer died while he was trying to write a story. Then that's no story, it's not yet published. Okay, so every story has a beginning and it has an end. So when we look at the way the story is arranged from beginning to the end, we're talking about plot. Where we have some stories, there's some stories that start from beginning, they go all the way to the end. For instance, the child was born or the child is born. The child goes to school. Secondary school, the, the child gains admission. He studies to be a doctor. He was almost lured into bad gang or to join cult or cultism, but he scaled through, got a very good job. He came back to the village, took his mom back to the city, built her a house, gave her a car, and they lived happily ever after. Sweet storyline from beginning to the end. In literature, we call that kind of storyline, we call it a linear storyline, a linear plot. Mathematics students will understand what I'm saying. When I say a linear graph, inequality is talking about linear graph, meaning graph on a straight line. So the storyline is on a straight line. You reach where you want to, you know, get to. But there are other types of plots. In fact, two different ones. Okay? They are non-linear. When we say something is non-linear, it's not straightforward. So we have the kind of story that starts from the middle. The story we use flashback to go to the beginning and then to come back to the middle, then go to the end. Let me give an instance. Imagine someone just coming back from, probably has gone to look for work and then he gets to meet his wife and the wife is telling him that it looks like this case has no solution. And the man is tired. While he's lying down, he sees a phone call. His mother asks him to come to the village. He gets to the village. The mother takes him to see a pastor or to see a chief priest. They are all priests. And so eventually, the chief priest tells him that he needs to think back to where he was in the NYSC stage or days. Can you remember any girl called Amaka? I know Amaka can disappoint. And the guy is thinking, Amaka, Amaka. Now, in your own video, you hear something that will do tiaow, and then the person will start remembering. In literature, we call that flashback. So, the story started from the center, then the guy will remember, the use flashback to take us to the beginning. That kind of a plot, the storyline is inorganic, it is non-linear. When you start from the middle, you use flashback to go to the beginning, then you now come back. Tiaow. Then everybody in that will now say, ah, you remember? Then the story will now continue to the end. That's a non-linear plot that starts from the middle. Now, there's another type of plot that starts from the end. Takes us from the end to the beginning. True flashback, they got to be remembering. And then the story will come back to the beginning. I mean to the end. For instance, you watch some movies where the guy, the story will just start in the courtroom. And you just hear, this court sentences you, Mr. and uh, Mr. So and so, to 10 years imprisonment or to 20 years imprisonment with ad labor. I rise. And then the guy will start crying. Oh, Chimo! Oh. And why he's crying? Tears are dropping from his eyes. And then the camera zooms closer to the face. And then you see a flashback of how he got to that position. They can go and start from probably while he was in secondary school. Eh? So that's kind of a plot. It's this kind of plot that is non-linear, that starts from the world, from the end. Okay, so when we talk about plot, we're talking about the arrangement of the storyline from beginning to the end. 
Some writers love to write from the beginning directly to the end. Some other writers like to start from the middle. They use flashback to take us to the end and then bring us back to the middle and then to the end. For instance, in your, uh, what do you call it, this Yeremi story, what's the story again? Yeremi story. Who? You said what? No, it's not a vessel of corruption. Yes. Eh? <laughs> Are these even literature students? <laughs> Sorry, God, God. So some of you have oh, you slept at home, you forgotten. Uh, you are shouting that you can remember. No, I can't hear you. Lonely days. Hey, now you are talking. In fact, so in your some of you are sleeping. You are not following this story at all. Are you? Are we together? Awesome. So in your lonely days, you me. You can see that we didn't know how Ajimobi died. She just started the story with a flashback. Okay, of how he, he was sick. How he died in her arms. So the story takes us from time to time, it takes us back and forth through flashback. Then the story continues to the end. That's how some writers love to write. Some other writers love to write from the end. They love to write from the very end. The person is already in the trouble, then they want to tell us how you going to the trouble. So that is that one plot. Now let's move to symbolism. Symbolism talks about using a particular character. Okay? A particular character or concept or name in a work of art to represent a message, to pass across a message, to represent something that needs to be addressed. Let me give an instance. Uh, when you look at the anvil and the armor, one of the points we're supposed to treat, anvil and the armor, you will discover that in the normal sense, when we talk about anvil, you can go to the dictionary to look it up, is that very flat metal, very thick metal, that we put other metals, metal that we just remove from fire. If you go to the blacksmith's place, you see them, they remove that metal, another metal from fire, they put it on top of that anvil, then they take a very big hammer, a sledge, and they are striking the iron. You know, when the iron is hot, you can still bend it, but when it cools down, it's not bending again. So they are smashing it on top of that anvil. So anvil is that flat surface upon which metal are being forged. You forge metal on top of it. Okay? Why armor is that thing that you use to apply force or pressure on top of the forged metal. Now, someone is saying, Mr. Femi, so how does this now relate to symbolism? If you read the poem from the beginning to the end, the poet is not saying anything about armor. Neither is he saying anything about anvil. In fact, if they talk about the forging house, he's not talking anything about what the, the, the poem itself has another meaning. In fact, the poem on its own is symbolism. Because anvil here, right, refers to the African culture. Why Amma refers to the what? The Western culture. Now, if you, if you look at it in the real sense, you will discover that the metal in between, you know, the anvil is on the bottom, the hammer is on top. Why the iron they are, you know, forging is in the center. You see that iron is used to talk about the African man that is already confused which one to pick. Is it his own African culture, anvil, or is it the armor, the foreign culture that he's supposed to pick? Which one? He's just there in the middle, and the two are hitting him from left to right. You that is born, and your name is Chikodi. Chikodi, because he grew up in Lagos. And you attended a very beautiful primary school, so secondary school, went to university abroad. You came back, your name is no longer Chikodi. You are now Chikod. Really, Chikod. That's not the name you were given. You have tried to modernize your African name. Some of you are very ashamed of your name. They say, What's your name? You have a name that is Awawu. You will not pronounce, you will not tell us that one. You tell us Mercy. So, you are, you are in this situation. You are the metal that the anvil and the hammer, Western culture and your own culture, they are smashing your head together in between. So this poem has symbol that you can relate with. So when we're talking about symbolism, you are using these words, okay, to represent a concept or a message they are passing across. That is what symbolism. Of course, you have other examples in um, uh, what do you call it? piano and drums by Gabriel Okara. 
The piano there represents Western culture. Why the drum? Africa is we use the skin of animal to make drum. So that's Africa in nature. So the drum represents African culture. Why piano represents what? Western culture. The person listening to it represents the African. So it's symbolism, we use symbolism to represent different message or ideas that we're passing across. Okay? So in every work of art, whether it's drama, prose, or poetry, you'll find it. And that is what that's about symbolism. How about imagery? Imagery. When we're talking about imagery, we're talking about the use of words to form image or picture, mental picture in the heads of people. Imagine someone saying, and the night went dark, a sudden outburst. Bullets everywhere, everyone running elter skater, scattered in the air, rain of bullets. The child and the mother beneath the tree, alas, she runs into the street only to be in the arms of the takers of the soul. Now, as I'm saying all I'm saying, I know that you are listening to me and you are trying to picture what I'm saying. You see, your ability to picture bullets in the air, everyone running elter skater, it's like you have left your body and you have entered into the situation that I'm describing and you can see it happening, people running out of state. So when you, when you can visualize what the person is saying through the use of words, like you can paint the image of what the person is saying in your head, then imagery has been achieved. In poetry, you can achieve imagery. In drama, you can achieve imagery. Uh, imagery. In prose, you can achieve imagery. All of that is very essential in understanding devices. The next one, diction. Diction. When we're talking about diction, we're talking about the choice of words. Do you understand what I'm driving at? We're talking about the choice of words. Now, by the choice of words, I mean that the English that has been used to express what the person is driving at. Let me give an instance. If you pick a book and you're reading it, and the English is simple enough for even someone in primary school to read, awesome. It means the diction is simple. But when you pick a book, for instance, Othello, the Othello you read, how many of you understood Othello in the first instance? Okay, which other one? Um, even she stoops to conquer. As interesting as she stoops to conquer is, many students will not even go ahead. They will just read the first page and drop it. So what I'm saying in essence is that the diction of those two, um, Othello and uh, she stoops to conquer, the diction could be quite difficult. Do you get that? Even that of Bigger Thomas, um, native song. It's not the conventional English could be quite difficult to understand. So we can say that the diction is not really easy to understand for a, an average reader. Okay, so diction basically talks about the English and the choice of word used to express what is to be said. Mood. Mood talks about the way, you know, the speaker feels, the person talking in the story, the mood, or the general impression that you have as you have read the book. How do you feel? That's the mood. Okay, the tone. The tone talks about the energy, okay, or the pattern with which the person who is writing, the, the persona, the dramatic persona, the poetic, the poetic persona, whatever tone, the sound, the way they sound when they talk, okay, that is what, that is tone. Then set, setting talks about the location or the places mentioned in the story. Okay, of course, you know you have, you have types of setting, okay, we have the social setting, okay, we have the imaginary setting. That or abstract setting, and of course, we have the physical setting or physical location. Now, physical location talks about the names of places that we can easily mention and go to in real life. That's physical location. Now, uh, abstract location are ideas of places that exist absolutely in nowhere or absolutely in the mind or in the head of the writer and the reader. So, that's absolutely an abstract, uh, what you call it, setting. Then we have social setting. If you're talking about social setting, you're talking about a time, a particular place that is traced by the behavior of people in that area. Okay, I learned about a place where um, um, if a man comes to visit his friend, he will have to use his wife, the person who is visited will use his wife to entertain the visitor. Okay, so when we talk about such things, people easily take their mind to that location. Even if the location is not mentioned, people know the location. Even if the location is not a location in Nigeria, People have a way of relating it to that location. So that's a social location. And last but not the least, that's periodic or era. Okay? That periodic talks about mentioning of dates, okay, and time. By that, people know the location we're talking about. In the next class, we'll see.